Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Living Your Greatness. This is your host, Ben Mummy. And today I am joined by a new guest to the show, and this is Nomi Prince. So for those of you that don't know Dr. Nomi Prince, she is a best-selling author, financial expert, and has a, an extreme amount of knowledge in terms of economics. She has valuable insights in terms of the global economics as well as financial systems. As a best-selling author, she has written influential books such as Collision, How Central Bankers Rich the World, and Permanent Distortion, How Financial Markets Abandon the Real Economy Forever. So Nomi, it is a pleasure to have you on the show with us today. Thank you so much, Ben. And I I, I love um, your show and, and the guests you've had on. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here today. I'm uh, super pumped to have you here because we actually met, you know, a couple of years ago in Vancouver at Vurek, right? You know, Jay Martin's conference. And, you know, we had moments here and there, you know, to kind of get to know each other. Um, but there was still a lot more, you know, besides sitting across the table or besides, you know, just quick conversations. So I'm really excited, even though I've been following your work, I'm excited to really have you on today as well as get to know you a little bit better. So to kind of start off, you know, me, if you could just tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, where did you spend your formative years growing up? And what inspired you, you know, to become a best-selling author, financial expert, and financial historian? Um, those are just <laughs> a great set of questions to start off with, Ben. And, you know, I grew up in a town called Poughkeepsie in upstate New York, not um, a well-known town, except for the fact that um, it had a railroad going through it that was um, very influential back in the days of sort of the, the robber barons and the Vanderbilts and um, some of the families that found the Hudson Valley to be their their fall home because it's, it's very beautiful um, with fall foliage and such in, in the autumn. Um, I grew up in a pretty basic home. Um, my father was the first of his family to get a doctorate um, in, in statistics, which is ultimately where um, my initial passions um, lay in terms of math, stat, figuring out the world, looking at patterns, playing chess, all the sort of geeky things that most kids don't do, but I was fascinated by because um, of my dad, I think. And um, I also developed a real sense from from him and my mom of, of wanting to be just independent. So, you know, in terms of how I got into um, the financial space, I think it was starting from the fact that I, I just wanted to have financial independence from a very young age you know when other kids were doing lemonade stands I was doing apple juice stands you know just always trying to sort of change things up a bit um, I went to a community college Dutchess Community College um, in Poughkeepsie um, and that was so that I could pay for college which at the time was $683 a semester which is unheard of today um, but I worked to pay for that in, in my um, hometown doing uh, math tutoring um, and playing piano. Um, I also have a, a, a strong sense of music um, and have played since um, I was very young. So all of that combination was kind of my formative years. Um, and then I went on to, I studied math in, in undergrad. Um, and then ultimately I got a job at the Chase Manhattan Bank, I was just 19. Um, apparently, I just heard this very recently, in fact, um, the my boss who hired me had to sort of not fill out some paperwork because technically I was too young to work there at the time. I did not find this out till many decades later, he's no longer there. Um, but it was the path of math, of programming, of engineering, of stat, of just looking at numbers to assess the world. That, that drove me ultimately to Wall Street, um, not so much the money, but that I that idea of being able to figure stuff out um, with the skills that I, I had and had developed. Um, and I was on Wall Street for a decade and a half. I worked at Chase Manhattan Bank. I worked at Lehman Brothers. I worked at Bear Stearns. I moved to London um, for Bear Stearns and ultimately uh, moved over to Goldman Sachs. Um, I was managing director of Goldman Sachs, senior manager director of Bear Stearns. So I worked my way up the sort of corporate chain of, of major international investment banks from those upbringings and um and then quit because it was all kind of corrupt and hurting the real world and I wanted to um, get out and tell people everywhere um, about what was going on inside and that's what led me to journalism to writing my first book and um, ultimately to our discussion here today. I love that well I appreciate you you know for taking the time you know to Tell us about your formative years. I always find that speaks a lot about someone, you know, hearing about your curiosity for math as well as 
music, which I didn't know that about you. And now I think all of my listeners obviously know that as well. And, um, you know, a question I have for you that I'm really curious about is sometimes mentors could also have a big impact on us. And I, I know, you know, you were on wall street and I know, you know, you were curious cause you, you kind of saw that perspective, but in your career, you know, in the last, you know, couple of decades, has there been any mentors that had an impact on you that also helped shape you who you are today? That is an interesting question. It kind of connects to, to what we just discussed. Um, so one was a math professor and one was um, also a professor, but that I worked with at Lehman. And I'll just tell you how they connect because I actually haven't thought about this until this question. So, so it's fabulous. But on the math side, I was studying um, mathematics at NYU, sort of fast forward a bit while I was working um, first at Chase and then at Lehman Brothers. So I would just basically duck into jeans at night, you know, take the subway, you know, get, get, get up to uh, Quran Institute, which was in the village. Um, Wall Street was downtown. So I'd work, I'd go to my classes, I'd skip in between, I'd come back. It was, it was kind of a, a lot of straddling. Um, and I had a professor, um, he's passed away since, his name was Howard Shapiro. And he was um, a fabulous mathematics professor. And I remember going through these back and forths and all the sort of stress of Wall Street and also um, at the time graduate work in math and stat. Um, I was busy, I didn't have time. And so um, there was this thing where every time he did, um, examinations who would allow us to take in one index card of notes and this was like crazy mathematica formulas this was like real analysis this was just like stuff that i barely can remember i did right now um and i did an exam there was an oral exam with with notes and i i, I did it miserably <laughs> um because when you have to look at notes um as he told me you don't really know know the material and that stuck with me literally forever as 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 you may know Ben because you you saw me speak um at the VRIC conference I didn't use notes um and so that has stuck with me um throughout all facets of my career is that if you don't really know something you don't really know something and if you can say it without notes and put it together through your own sort of brain patterns and, and, you know, ways of communicating, um, that's when you really know stuff. So it was he who took me aside and said, look, if you don't know these formulas, you don't know these formulas, don't look at notes. And I was like, but, but you said I could, he's like, no, I said that I say that to all my students, you don't look at notes. Um, so that, that was one thing that really stuck with me as a kind of mentor throughout the whole wall street, um, education process I went through. And then I had a fellow uh, named John Merrick at, um, Lehman brothers. We sat next to each other on the desk. He had hired me in. Um, and he understood my straddling of getting an education and also working like I don't know, 15 hours a day sometimes on Wall Street. And um, and he he very much was a mentor to me in terms of um, really just helping me sort of balance the two and say, look, if one feeds into another, you're going to find your own connections all the time between them, which, again, was very much something that stuck with me um, at the time, watching the markets, doing all the analysis I did for Lehman Brothers, as well as what I was doing theoretically at NYU. Um, I needed to find a way to process that. He, he allowed me the time and conversation and advice um, to basically allow me to think about processing things in my own way, you know, not how it was supposed to be, but using my own processes of like of thinking um to just connect the dots i love that well you know what something that i understood from those mentors and it definitely explains to you know the the beautiful woman that you are you know as an independent thinker um and as well as someone who i feel um has really showcased in terms of understanding right if we understand knowledge then we have better insights and then hopefully we can make better decisions right so something that I want to kind of lead to here is I know you've recently, you know, published another book, you know, and you've put out a lot of good ones out there, but the one that I want to talk about, and before we hop in, it's called, you know, permanent distortion, right? So for my listeners to get a better understand of, you know, kind of what the word means, if you could share your definition of what that means to you and, you know, why does this concept matter for people to actually care about it? Yeah, that's a great question. So permanent distortion is is my most recent book and I coined that term and 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 it it stands for the sort of permanent we're not going back to any sort of prior thing um disconnect between uh, the financial systems and the financial markets and the real economy, real assets, real workers, real jobs, real physical tangible 
items, real development, real growth. Um, and it's not that there aren't relationships between the two, but in the wake of really two events, one was the financial crisis of 2008, which I wrote about in, um, on a couple of books, but in It Takes a Pillage, um, partially in All the President's Bankers and, and also partially in Collusion, um, and the pandemic of, of, of 2020. The, the, in those two moments, um, the Federal Reserve, the, the US's central bank, the sort of mother bank of private banks, um, went on this sort of binge of, of creating money under the auspices of, in the financial crisis of 2008, helping the banking system and therefore helping real people. And in the pandemic, helping um, with subsidies that the government was putting together because everybody was locked down for real people. And what permanent distortion unravels is that actually these, these two moments among many were not about helping real people. They weren't really about helping the real economy. In fact, that was the narrative and still is in so many places. But the reality is, um, and I trace the money, I trace the numbers, that a lot of this money just just did go into the markets and, and not through people. It wasn't like people got stimulus checks and then it went into the markets, which is the sort of overall narrative that happened. It, it wasn't that. It was that it went through financial players, speculators, hedge funds, private banking, trading funds, and so forth, um, trading desks and so forth. And that's that's what happened. And that's why the markets took off uh, multiple times over that period relative to the real economy, which for the most part has stagnated in growth. And, and, I, and I just talk about that sort of as a global phenomenon. And, and the reason that impacts people, the reason that we should all care is because when people don't feel that they're um, connected to their economy or that they're falling behind and they see numbers like the stock markets are up or even when they're down because then their 401k, 401ks or their savings accounts get hit, but they're sort of battered about by these headlines and these things that happen. Um, and that makes people just feel uncomfortable and, and, and unstable. And so I talk about how that can manifest in lots of different ways in 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 civil unrest in um you know economic decline in just the general um disillusionment um of people in in their governments who make these decisions or in or in their economy or moving ahead at, at any at any point um in in one's life from sort of graduating high school through retirement and and so i talk about how um, this phenomenon, it, it is permanent, doesn't mean there aren't things we can do about it. I talk about that as well. Um, but there isn't sort of some age where we're going to go back to a, a period of time where money isn't sort of fabricated out of nowhere by central banks that ultimately doesn't help real people. Right. Absolutely. Well, I appreciate that explanation because it gives people, I think, a better idea of, you know, your book as well as, you know, what this conversation will kind of lead to. So I want to go a little bit further here. You know, um, you have described, you know, that the financial markets have abandoned like the real economy in your book. And a question I have is like, what are some of the main drivers that have contributed to the divergence between financial markets and the real economy? Yeah. So um, mostly um, the driver comes from a, a strong century old relationship really between the private banking system, the major banks um, and all the other sort of financial players and the, the Federal Reserve Bank, which is the bank to those banks, um, which was created in 1913. Um, there, there's a lot of stories about that. Um, I, I have, I don't know, a good 50 or 60 pages on of original research um, about that in my book, All the President's Bankers. Um, and as a result of, of sort of this idea that there would be a bank that could help banks, but not people, um, which was created um, back over a century ago, um, the sort of seeds of divergence were were sown. Um, and then over the years, um, what, what has happened is, and particularly again, since the financial crisis, that institution ha has been able to sort of turbo boost the amount of money that they can manufacture that has just gone into financial markets. Now to compound that, there have been more hedge fund players that have grown along those markets because when money's being fabricated, when the cost of money, when interest rates are low and they're a bit higher now, but just sort of historically, um, it, it allows players to speculate with that money. You know, the cheaper money is um, and the larger financial institution or player you are, the easier it is to speculate with that money. It's like the equivalent of you know, going to Vegas and having someone else foot your blackjack bill, right? If someone else is footing it and you don't have to pay it back, um, you, you take more risk. 
you know, you stay at the table a bit longer. You just assume someone's going to cover it. Sometimes that risk pays off along the way and sometimes it doesn't, but, but you're not responsible to it. And that's basically our current financial system, that the largest financial players aren't responsible um, for the lit, for the risks that they impose um, because of this whole structure on, on the markets and on their for real people. Um, so, so that's part of, again, one of, one of the sort of main themes of, of permanent distortion. And what that means also is that there's not money left over. I mean, there is some money obviously left over. There is still growth. People still get paid. It's not like it's, it's totally binary, but, but there's not enough coming into, um, you know, research and development, building bridges, building roads, building hospitals, you know, fortifying schools. I mean, all the things that sort of are part of, um, overall society, um, from the standpoint of economics and 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 help helping more people on the foundation of the economy um, grow their lives and feel secure in their lives um, because the money's going to a place where it can multiply more quickly. I talk about money as a virus um, in the book, I think, because I wrote it during the pandemic. <laughs> that was my homework during the pandemic to write that book. Um, but money always seeks to go to the place where it can multiply the fastest, right? So the cheaper, like a virus. So the cheaper it is to get that money, i.e. the more there's external entities that manifest it like like the federal reserve and other other central banks and the more that the private banks can use it um the more they will and it'll go into the markets more than it will go into the real economy because it's it's easier to multiply itself there um and it's a longer term project on so many levels um to fund lasting permanent growth in the real economy absolutely yeah no that makes a lot of sense um, something that I want to bring up, you know, I think it's important, you know, for all my listeners, you know, who are tuning in, you know, like the average worker or kind of everyday, you know, person, um, you know, could you talk about how the distorted financial system affects average workers and the everyday citizens and what are the consequences and impacts that we face as a huge result of this? Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, one example just right now for, for, um, which is what's been happening is that we've had high inflation right over the last year or so everybody sort of knows about that the price of gas has gone really high now it's a little bit less um but 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 it's still a major cost to most people the price of food has gone up the price of rent has gone up the price of uh you know home affordability has gone up so unless you have like a whole pool of money to begin with it's really difficult um for many people to to make their budget with the wages that they are getting paid and yet for example the, the federal reserve has been raising rates to to combat this idea of inflation or rising prices in, you know, at the tank, in your food and your rent and so forth. Um, but by doing so, they've made it more expensive for people to, um, for example, get lending for small businesses they may want to start or uh, for people on the sort of lower end or sort of entry end of the housing market to get approved for mortgages or to be able to afford mortgages. They're twice as expensive now, a monthly payment for the same value house um, as they were a year ago. So this is an example where um, all this money came into the system. Other forces actually ca cost, um, caused a lot of the inflation. I mean, the Fed didn't create, uh, you know, a war between Russia and Ukraine that, well, an invasion of Ukraine by Russia that effectively spiked oil prices at the time. Um, but the manifestations were that it caused the Fed to raise rates, which caused money to be more expensive, which caused us, um, real people, um, less of an ability to both make ends meet to pay for things, as well as... Um, to borrow the money that is part of um, buying that house or getting an education um, or, or, or things that we, we may need to do. And this disconnect still um, still exists today. So, so there is a really harsh impact on unreal people on the upside. Um, I say the upside where, where markets are going up, where the Fed's pouring money aggressively into the system and it's not going to the real economy and real people. It's not really changing most people's wages and it's not really changing um, the amount of money people need to pay for any of those items, you know, education, health, food, gas, et cetera. Um, and then on the flip side, when the Fed changes course and raises rates and makes it more expensive to, to, to borrow and more expensive for people to get funds, um, then they're double hurt um, because they're still paying relatively high prices on items that, that they need. Um, and they're also finding it more expensive to, to borrow. And as a result, uh, for example, we see in the United States, there's, there's figures um, that the, the New York Fed, one of the 12 branches of the Federal Reserve System, has just put out that say that, that 
the the cost of borrowing for the average person, you know, on credit cards, on different forms of credit is is higher than it's been in decades. And what that means is people are getting squeezed. First, they're borrowing. Second, they're paying more for borrowing. And third, that means that what they're getting paid isn't accommodating um, the cost of their living. And and all of those together, I mean, that's that's a major impact for for people that live in the real world. Absolutely. No, I'm I'm glad that you painted that picture. You know, you explained it so well of, you know, what's going on. And I really respect how truthful you are. You know, it takes courage to talk about real, real stuff that's going on right now in today's markets as well as economics. But, you know, it makes me kind of think, you know, in the face of the growing divide between, you know, financial markets and the real economy, you know, what are some actions then that investors or the everyday person you know, can do to protect their wealth, you know, so they could thrive and and stay healthy financially. Yeah. So the outcome um, on, on the investment side, I'll take that first of um, the sort of cheapening of money, you know, the ability to create effectively paper money out of nowhere, which is what we basically had in our markets, um, particularly since the financial crisis, even a little bit before that, actually really going back to the early 2000s um, in different ways. Um, is that hard assets, like actual things, have more value. And they have more value because um, there's either physical scarcity or it gets used in real things. And so, for example, you take something like gold or silver or copper in terms of the sort of trio of, of precious and use metals. Um, there has been recently a, a, a very big upsurge in the price of gold. And one of the reasons for that is, um, and I think it will continue, is that gold represents... A, a sort of reality um, of, 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 of wealth preservation and, and an ability to sort of stand in the face of not just inflation, but what the Federal Reserve or other central banks are going to do because of inflation, which is a new wrinkle um, to the old histor historical story of why gold has inflation uh, protection value. So um, so that's one thing I think people should should be invested in more. And also gold has an ancillary use value. I mean, it, it's, it's used... Um, to an extent as a reserve currency for a lot of central banks around the world. There's been more buying of gold by um, global central banks, particularly ones in emerging markets, as a way to sort of hedge against um, the dollar and what's been happening with the Federal Reserve and the, and the really the weakness, um, the, the amount of banks that have failed recently in uh, the U.S. banking system in particular. Um, so, so that I see as a real way to um, to combat and be outside of sort of the the, the paper financial system um, in the real asset world. Same thing with silver. Silver is going to be part of and is, um, you know, the major transition in the energy world from um, whatever we have in tra traditional energy, and that's not going away. We're not we're not not going to be using oil and natural gas anytime soon. But as we evolve into um, better conductivity, more efficient electricity. Um, processing and getting, you know, from, from the charge to the end point, all of that's going to use better, um, more and more metals. And that's going to be the metals that have good conductivity and that's going to be silver and that's going to be copper. So, so those are areas also to invest in. And then the, the other area I could go on with metals forever. I think that that's really um, where the investment opportunity lies for now and for years um, is, um, is in uranium, right? We have a kind of middle point of traditional energy and sort of new energy, um, whether that's solar or wind or hydropower, uh, geothermal and so forth. And um, and that's nuclear. And, and nuclear energy is something that, that is clean, that has had safety issues, um, that is get, getting better in terms of um, using technology to ensure safety. Um, and it's a, it's a cleaner form of energy for the environment. And it's also a way more productive form of energy in terms of how much you can get out of uh, nuclear power from uranium. Um, than a lot of other sources of power. So I think that's like the mega sort of place that if you're thinking about investing like now and like closing your eyes for 10 years, that would be, um, that space would be the place to do it in. Um, so those are sort of the areas where um, that's one thing you do. And from a standpoint of also being outside the system, like small businesses and stuff, and this is going back to just my own personal life, um, not go back to, but going to my current personal life, which is that um, my husband and I, and I own a, a a tasting room uh, for our wine uh, in um, in Ojai, California. Um, anyone's welcome to come and have a tasting. But the point being that um, we spend a lot of time in, in that community um, working with other small businesses to share business. Um, so I'll give you an example. Um, a new flower shop just opened around the corner from us. Um, and 
new guy to town, new couple actually. Um, and they basically said, look, here's, here's one of our arrangements. Um, and they, they, they just gave us um, a really beautiful floral arrangement as a, as a, as a hello, we're, we're here now. Um, and we in turn are basically using them for some of our private events. Now this all happened within the period of like two weeks. Um, so we, we're giving um, them exposure to our customers and their flowers are, are making our events prettier. Um, and so I think there's a lot of ways this is, that's on a sort of physical level, but even on a technological level across the, um, you know, through the internet that, that I think as small businesses and small pieces of the foundational economy, all of us can think more about um, working with other companies, even in things that are completely different from what we do, but sort of sharing um, that part of our economy. And, and, and so I think that's a very big um way that we can affect our own well-being and, and if you don't have a business in your town just just buy local right i mean just just whatever it is um think about that totally yeah absolutely no, i think you brought up some some really good points you know i like the fact that you spoke about you know right now to protect and preserve wealth you know gold and silver obviously on like a monetary level is a, is a great example but also even beyond that right you know in terms of the other reasons why it's so compelling right now, you know, to invest in, you know, the gold, silver space, you also brought up uh, uranium as well, right? In terms of the green side that's to come or the, the all the industrial uses that kind of plays out, right? So I appreciate that. And then I also really enjoyed too, you giving that other perspective, you know, to local businesses and kind of how we could not just support our economy, but also, from that kind of standpoint of view. So I really, really appreciated that. And it, it actually makes me think, question that I'm really curious to ask you is, you know, what changes or kind of reforms do you think are needed to address the imbalances caused by major financial institutions? So, you know, in terms of like the Federal Reserve and to promote a more inclusive or sustainable economic system, how can we make this shift? Um, those are really good questions. I mean, one one area um, that relates to the Federal Reserve and and sort of the major banks, Wall Street banks, or basically the banks we think of as major banks, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, Bank of America, sort of the major banks as well as the major um, funds like like BlackRock and so forth, is that these institutions had become so big, um, they're not just too big to fail, as 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 the saying goes. They're, they're actually um, too influential in terms of how money flows and the risk um, that we talked about a bit before that they can impose on the system by by just doing too many speculative things and not having enough oversight from, for example, the Federal Reserve that it's supposed to be their job, even though they don't do it very well and they don't talk about it very much. Um, so one thing that can be done is to actually make the Federal Reserve do its day job um, or strengthen the legislation that created the Federal Reserve in, in sort of a new act to say, look, you know, you're, you're, you're really abysmal at regulatory <laughs> oversight. Um, you know, we've had a lot of banks fail. Um, we have a bank, for example, J.P. Morgan Chase. I used to I used to work for Chase. Um, I was um, also at Bear Stearns when Bear Stearns failed um, in 2008. J.P. Morgan bought it, became bigger. Um, and um, just recently, um, we, 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 uh, J.P. Morgan Chase bought bought another bank, um, bought First Republic, became bigger. Um, this is all under the auspices of the Fed, and every time that happens, it it consolidates more money and power um, on to the the hands of the top of the financial food chain. Um, so I don't think that's a good thing. I haven't thought that's a good thing for 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 decades, which is why um, I wrote about when I first left Wall Street. I first left Goldman Sachs in uh, I left in two thousand two. Um, but my first book, Other People's Money, The Corporate Mugging of America, came out in 2004. Um, and so during those two years, I was I was doing a lot of talks. I was I was you know embarking in journalism. I was writing the book and so forth, talking about how Wall Street really um, works with the Fed to to manipulate money, and um, and not like in a conspiratorial sort of way, but like an actual factual you know data laid out kind of way. And um, and I I advocated for. Um, making the big bank smaller. Um, this was this was in 2004. Obviously, we had a financial crisis uh, in 2008. The big banks are still big. They're, they're not only big, they're bigger. And we have this other set of, of players like, like BlackRock um, that have amassed so, so much uh, retail and institutional money that they can move the markets as well by pulling in and out of sectors or in and out of names. Um, and, and all of that is, is a recipe for 
financial system instability. Um, I've spoken in the Senate about this at a Senate hearing um, last year about BlackRock um, and those sorts of institutions and why we need them to be made smaller. Um, I've, I've written books about it. I've spoken to numerous uh, Congress people and senators and staffers along the years on these items. Um, whether that's going to happen or not, um, after doing this for all the, almost two decades, um, it's not clear to me that there's a full understanding. No, that's not even true. It's very clear to me that there is not an understanding um, in our governments of the risks that not doing anything continue to, to pose on, on everybody else. I really appreciate that answer. You know, um, I think it gives a lot of context of of what are solutions or ways that we could improve. Um, and I appreciate you also, you know, sharing that personal experience, you know, from being part of those, uh, you know, banks and, and seeing that perspective. Um, something that I want to shift to, you know, is, you know, when we hear all this information, you know, of like the truth of what's really going on, you know, it can make us feel fragile, right? It can make us feel concerned. It can make us feel uncomfortable, right? And I think it's really important, anything in life, but especially if we look at finance right now, because that's what we're having this conversation about, is we could choose to be anti-fragile or fragile. Mm -hmm. So a question I have for you is, you know, obviously it sounds like, you know, you've also made decisions, you know, by some of the investments that you've done or, or that you speak of, you know, of how we could protect ourselves, but how do you still teach yourself to embrace an anti-fragile mindset so you could thrive and, you know, financially feel well? Um, that's, that's an excellent question. I think it's true of finance and, and of life that, um, you have to recognize that, to be anti-fragile, there will be moments of fragility, you know? So I just want to put that right out there. You have to recognize that um, as strong as you may want to be and, and strive to be in, in, in finance and investments in life, there, there will be setbacks. So, so just putting that in context, what that means is having patience um, in attaining anti-fragility, realizing that, you know, to come into shore within a sort of the stormy sea, you're going to have sort of sways back and forth, but you're ultimately going to sort of fix yourself on a point. So I think everyone, and for me, this is true. I, I mentioned that um, I paid for my own uh, education at community college. The reason I did that um, when I was 16, actually, I graduated high school early, but the reason I, I did that is not because my parents wouldn't have paid for the $683, um, but it's because I had an innate sense of wanting to be able to pay for myself. And I think that's part of this idea of anti-fragility and figure out ways to get there. Now I could have gone and I did get accepted to way more expensive colleges. Um, it was my choice to the chagrin, I think of my parents um, to even go to a community college um, instead of, uh, yeah, for example, Vassar, which was very expensive and, and more prestigious and all of that, even in my hometown, um, none of even other places. But the point being that um, I've always found it very, important to be okay with um, making choices that allow you to maximize where you are from a financial standpoint and not necessarily to overreach, right? So so growing investments over time and, and, and slowly and having the patience with that is a way to become anti-fragile. Um, when I, when I um, quit Goldman Sachs um, and I left a, a huge, um, you know, potential, um, well, a huge compensation package and, and the potential for much more. Um, it was not because I thought I would make more money as a journalist, because like, that's crazy. Nobody makes more money as a journalist than as uh, a managing director at a major investment firm. But the reason I did it was because I wanted freedom. Um, and so I made choices about what my financial situation would look like. Um, and I realized that there was a strong possibility, I did not know this at the time, that I would never make any money again. Um, and it wasn't even that I had a, a huge cushion. Yes, I had a cushion, but the idea was that um, I would be okay with that. And so I guess what I'm, what I'm getting at here is the mentality of being okay with your financial situation it actually allows you the freedom to create it and to grow it. Um, and then it's important to make good investments. And then it's important to not um, be too frivolous with your outlays, not saying anyone watching here is, but the idea being that you, you're you always protecting and growing at the same time. And, and that's the way to, um, I think, achieve that sort of financial freedom and that anti-fragility, I, lo I love the term, um, because you're going to get 
battered about you know there's going to be choppy winds all of that but the idea is like sort of the concept of steady growth and um pruning where necessary um and making decisions along that way i think goes a long uh, way towards financial stability totally absolutely and um you know i really appreciate that answer you know very very thorough um and it makes me think you know knowing like your specialty right now and kind of everything that you've done over the years you know, what are other, if we're thinking in the future, what are other potential, you know, future scenarios or even developments that can make, you know, the permanent distortion between financial markets as well as real economy worse or better? And how can investors, you know, again, you know, position themselves, you know, to thrive? Yeah, so I, I think one of the things that we're, we're very close to seeing will be that the Fed will pause on rates. Right. Um, they've they've hiked rates from basically zero to five percent in the last year and a couple months. I think they're getting ready either um, in June or July to probably June, maybe July, but to stop doing that. Right. And what that means is there's going to be a, 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 a pause in the uncertainty about the cost of money. Right. Um, and I think that gives us an opportunity for a, a lot of these other investments that, that I've been talking about, gold, silver, copper, lithium, um, you know, Precious um, some rare metals, um, rare earth metals to um, to thrive because now we're in a position where the next move of the Fed will ultimately be to cut rates again, and will ultimately be to print money again to help the fragility of the banking system. And what that will mean is uh, money will again have less value, and hard assets will have more value. And I think we're sort of at the cusp of the next phase of that. Um, so it's a good time to get positioned for that. And then the next. Um, well, and what that will do, though, is it will create more of a distortion down between the financial assets and, and the real economy. But but knowing that in advance will be a way for investors to position themselves into that period. Um, so I think that that both increases the permanent distortion, but also presents those opportunities um, in terms of decreasing the permanent distortion. It's 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 more about um, investors and, 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 and businesses and individuals working outside of that main financial system. So again, investing in hard assets, um, working with small businesses uh, together and, and, and those sort of things are what actually can, can decrease um, the divide between the financial paper markets and the real economy because you're, you're, you're we're focusing more of our attention um, and our maybe collective money and energy in into the area outside of like the banking system driven area i appreciate that answer those are great points and it makes me think to you you know what if your thesis was wrong you know everything that you brought up today which you know how, how could you use your circle of competence you know other individuals who are doing great work out there who are also speaking truthfully of of what they see you know but how could you use that as well as your work you know to justify that your thesis will pro most probability be right? It's a good question, because when my book actually came out, um, which was in October of last year, um, it was during a period where the Fed had just engaged in several 75 basis point hikes. So they are on a very aggressive um, sort of path. And the whole thesis of my book um, was that they basically create money. They, they make it looser. That's what we've been dealing with for the last couple of decades. And that's why we have this permanent distortion. So at the time, um, I did get questions as to, well, are, isn't it over now? I mean, they're raising rates. They're, they're, they're selling off some of their bonds. I mean, aren't you late? And I was like, well, no, because I'm, again, I'm looking at this to, to my other point and a sort of longer term development here. And I, I truly believe that at some point the Fed's going to print money again and rates are going to go down again. And we're just in a sort of pause of all of that. Um, and as it happened, just in the last two months, when we've had several bank failures in the United States from Silicon Valley Bank, um, you know, First Republic, there's there's a number of retail banks on on the docket, you know, Silvergate uh, failed. Um, a lot of that was because of these, these aggressive um, sort of hikes. But also the Fed did create $300 billion worth of money out of nowhere. Um, which is what I had said would happen uh, a number of months before that when 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 there were people who thought, well, no, it's over. And feds, the feds turned a corner. It's never going to happen again. So it's not to say, Ben, that I am suggesting that what you're saying about my being wrong will never happen. <laughs> I'm, I'm just merely saying that um, the way I look at it, um, we, we are in a very long term 
um, development here. But let's say it doesn't. Let, let's say the Fed never creates another dollar again. Um, let's say rates still where they are again. So there's no conversation about rates going down or up. We're just in a holding pattern um, sort of forever. And um, sort of my thesis about money being created just, just doesn't play out ever again. Um, if that's the case, I still believe um, that the way for, for people and investors to be um, more secure and also have greater wealth upside um, is still to invest in real assets and is still to invest in um, the growth of, of physical structures that we will need or technological innovations that aren't like Facebook, but that are actually, um, you know, useful to, um, you know, health technology or energy technology or, or education or something like that. So um, I still see this idea of, of, of physical realness of, um, of assets and, you know, moving on from there, technologies and, and, and sort of structures um, as important for um, investing going through the long term. I really appreciate that answer because it also kind of clarifies, you know, being a value-based investor, right? So regardless of what plays out, um, you know, things that are physically valuable, um, you know, there, there's many things, right? And there's the macro picture, which you have that standpoint, but all that being said, you know, there's investors that have been talking about this for years, you know, like Benjamin Graham, right? The intelligent investor, right? How, how to be better at value-based investing. One of Rick Rule's, you know, favorite mentors, you know, Peter Kundal, you know, he was mm -hmm. another great example of a, of a value-based investor, right? So I appreciate that answer. Thank you for letting me uh, challenge you there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, leading to my next question, you know, what does it take, you know, to become a great investor? Because someone can make the right decisions or invest in, in the right spaces, but there's still a difference of being good and then going to great. So what do you think makes a great investor? Um, I'd say the single most thing that makes at least the possibility of being a great investor is, um, is not being emotionally connected to your investments. Um, and what that means is um, whatever your investment portfolio looks like, whatever choices you make, that you're able to um, determine Wall Street as clip coupons, um, which basically means taking small profits along the way and, and sort of waiting for reentry points. And if they don't happen, just move on. Um, or also mitigating losses along the way. Now, for, for me, I am always uh, more down on myself as 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 an investor when I don't take small gains off the table because I'll, I'll I'll look at a position um and uh and I'll say all right well this thing's been it's up twenty percent in in a week you know because it, it, it's great investment momentum's there everything aligned it aligned in time it's up twenty percent you're like oh well maybe it could go up twenty five percent maybe thirty percent and you have this conversation with yourself and and inevitably always. When I think a position should be taken off at the 20%, let's say, and then something happens in the market, it goes back down to zero or negative, I get annoyed with myself. And so the flip side of that is I, I really try to be very um, disciplined about taking successions of gains sort of along the way instead of banking um, some of that upside along the way. Um, and in addition to that is, is, is having the patience to do that. Sometimes you're just writing a, a position or, or a thesis um, in your investment portfolio and that's fine. Um, but sometimes there is that ability to acknowledge that markets will whip you around um, even for the best investment. And, um, and the best way to deal with that is um, to sort of detach again emotionally to the investment, look at the numbers um, and, and take small gains along the way. Awesome. That's great. So two points I got from that, you know, don't be greedy. Right. And then the other thing is, you know, we are emotional as human beings. So how do we develop maybe mental fitness tools or mental models or our own kind of principles or rules, right. To better manage our emotions, make better decisions. Right. So I really appreciate that. Um, and the next question I want to go to is, you know, the purpose of the podcast, you know, I was telling you before we came on like the show today, you know, it's really to inspire millions of people, you know, to achieve greatness or be their best at kind of what they desire to do and enhance their overall health and well-being. So my question to you is, you know, what is your definition of greatness? Uh, okay, my definition of greatness is, is actually to have peace with what you do. 
Um, because if, um, if you can have that, which again, allows you to be patient, allows you to make mistakes, allows you to take small gains. I mean, you know, sort of connecting that to the investment, um, arena. Um, it also allows you to live your life, um, to the best of, um, how that can look, um, without worrying about your portfolio. Right. So if we're, we're sort of like connecting the two together, um, that, 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 that's one thing is basically to, to, um, to have peace, to have freedom, um, to basically have the confidence in yourself to roll with the punches, um, honestly. And so it's not necessarily, I used to think it was like, well, I need to win a Pulitzer Prize for one of my books and that will make me great. Um, I still would like to win a Pulitzer Prize for one of my books, but, but I, I've, I've abandoned the, the attachment to it. Um, hopefully, um, I say hopefully because that gives me more peace and freedom to write what I want to write. And if it happens, it happens. And I think sort of that philosophy um, and people that embody that philosophy um, are great. That's beautiful. Well, I, I really admire your definition. Um, it sounds like to you that you realize, okay, there can be external, you know, celebrations, you know, or achievements, but really, you know, value-based, you know, goals or value-based, you know, like knowing your, your core values and, and those fulfillments of, of really feeling them and kind of experiencing them, you know, and, and through their, you know, living our potential. Right. And to a lot of people, you know, that are tuning in, you know, that can mean many different things. Right. So I really appreciate that. And, um, you know, my next question I want to go to Nomi is, you know, now that you've a feel good of my podcast, you know, in terms of what it's all about, you know, who is a future guest, you know, someone that, you know, personally that you would love to see on the show. <laughs> um, you know who I, I, you may or may not have had him, but I, I really think, um, you guys would benefit from Jim Rickards, um, mm -hmm. and, and having him on the show. Cause he, um, you know, in this space, he has always stayed true. I've known him for a long time. He's always stayed true to his, um, his thoughts and opinions. Um, you know, you, you, he is, who he is. And, and I think he'd be a really great um, person to interview um, in the investment space. And also just in terms of, you know, the life he's had um, and the way in which he approaches things. Um, so I think that that could be a, a good one. Um, and I will get back to you on some others that that, that sort of stands out to me um, initially. I know you've had Rick Rule on, I would say put Rick Rule on, but I, but I know that he has been on, um, but I certainly admire his sense of that that patience that longevity i mean that um also what he does is is he connects with with people and with companies and with themes over years and years and years and i i do admire that um about him but again you have had him on yeah no i i appreciate that those are some great names um i take you up on the challenge um and i'll make sure that when i get a uh, jim on you know to let you know um, and, and, and share that with you, you know, in terms of what we create in terms of insights and valuable lessons and stories, and most importantly, you know, his specialty, you know, um, but, um, yeah, no, I really appreciate that. And I want to take the last moment, you know, to really, you know, it's been a really good discussion today. I've had a lot of fun, but where can my audience go? You know, if they have questions or they want to follow your work or they want to buy one of your books where can they go, you know, to access all of your work? That's, I mean, my my website's the best place to do that. So it's just Um, I do have um, one of the tabs up there, um, an ability for people if they want to sign up and just kind of hear what I'm doing. It's not so much investment advice, but it's kind of what I'm thinking now, where I'm going. Sometimes stuff might wind up um, in a book. Um Sometimes information might might be useful to people from from the investment perspective, but that's not the intent. So um, they can definitely sign up there. Um, they will only get one email a month, so that's not going to be a crazy inundation. Um, it has all my Twitter info, my Instagram info, and everything else on the site, as well as uh, ways to buy books. Um, I do um, have links to different places to buy books. I, I do also very much support independent bookstores. Um, so I would say that if you do see something on my website, you can follow the links there. Um, and also if you have a local bookstore, um, you know, they, they, they might have my books in it already, or you can ask for them there. Awesome. Great. So I will be sure, you know, to put that in the, in the podcast description and notes. So everyone knows where they need to go. And, um, 
yeah, I want to take this last moment, you know, to really thank you for being here today. You know, thank, thank you for you. sharing your insights, your wisdom, and most importantly, who you are as an authentic person. I, I've really enjoyed uh, the time today. Thank you so much for having me on, Ben. I, I, I enjoy the time as well. Thank you.